his creation. Um, Psalm 29 is, is, is considered by many to be one of the most beautiful psalms there is. And in its beauty, Psalm 29 describes the Lord's power, specifically in a storm, okay? Um, you know, perhaps we have a little bit less ability to realize the power of God in something as simple as a thunderstorm uh, because we know the science behind it, or if we don't know it, we know that we can know it. We, we know that we can study it and find out exactly how thunderstorms, lightning storms come about. Uh, uh, and, and even with the knowledge of how God accomplished it, well, that, that's the point. We need to realize that just because we are, God's given us brains strong enough to be able to figure out how he created science to work doesn't diminish in one, one iota at all God's ability to do that. Recognize something. We know how to make, uh, cause electricity to come about, but I don't, <laughs> we certainly don't have the ability to cause a thunderstorm amount of energy to occur naturally by God's providence because of the way God has set things up for it to start up and then for it to shut off, for it to end, you know, on its own. If man tried to accomplish such a thing, can you imagine the disaster that would occur by just our trying to do it? And then would we be able to stop it if we could do it? Now, there's the, there's the problem. We don't have the ability to do it on our own. Uh, and if we were able to do it, if there was some way for us to do it, do you realize that all we would be doing is is using God's natural laws to cause it to happen? Even if we were one day able to cause, to have thunderstorms start and stop when we wanted them to, the only possible way for us to do it would be to use God's natural processes that he created in the beginning to be able to to. Uh, accomplish such an event, all right? So even there, it's kind of like the old joke about a, uh, about a scientist who discovered how to make life. And, and, and so he looks, up and, he looks up in the sky as if a person could do that. But if they could do it, I could, I could hear this conversation between the scientist and God. Now look, I now have the power to create life. You're not the only one. And, and God says back, oh, really? Show me. And he reaches down and grabs a bunch of dirt. And God says, whoa, 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 one, one minute. Get your own dirt. All right? And, and, and the point of the matter is he's using something God has created in order to be able to, in his words, create life. Well, that's not creating life. Life, life comes from, creation comes from nothing. And God is the one who is the only one who is able to create something out of nothing. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Mary. Good to have you here. So, um, yes, sir. I would just remind me of the fact that uh, uh, God, God's weakness is stronger than man mm -hmm. in all their greatness, and they think in their minds. And the, and the weakness or the, the, the power and the wisdom of man is just foolishness with God. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we, we cannot hope to be able to match what God is able to accomplish. Because once again, to, to be quite blunt about it, we are God's accompl accomplishment. Even if we, even with everything that we're capable of doing, do you realize that when we studied that in our last Psalm, Psalm 22, it already belongs to God in the first place. The way, uh, and that wasn't Psalm 22. What was that we just studied? Psalm 24. Psalm 24. There it is. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So quite frankly, because we belong to God, anything we accomplish already belongs to God. All right? It is, it is His. And so, so even in that aspect, and then to realize that we have no power to be able to do what God is able to accomplish. So the little bit we can do belongs to God anyway, and God out, out, 
um, matches us in every possible way with the things that he is able to accomplish. And so, Paul, Paul, go ahead. Paul recognized this too. In Romans 12 and verse 2, a man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Amen. But to think soberly, righteously. Amen. Amen. And so, so all that said, morning, Robert. All that said, we want to look at Psalm 29 with the awe-inspiring view of what God is able to accomplish just in a thunderstorm. Understand something. A thunderstorm, as powerful as, as it is, is, is a small thing for God and an impossible thing for man to create. Okay. So, so let's read those, those these uh, 11 verses, and then we're going to look over them. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to him, I'm sorry, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Okay. Morning, Aunt Mary. Now, let us go ahead. Let's go ahead and consider each one of these, each one of these ideas being given here. There's like seven or eight different things mentioned that you we we notice during a lightning storm, during a thunderstorm. And again, uh it's it's it, we need to be ascribing what we're experiencing to God. And by the way, not just a thunderstorm. On a sunny day, the beautiful the beautiful sunlight we experience on a, on a on a rainy day the the fact of the of the the ground receiving its moisture the crops receiving its moisture all these things should be something that we we just incredibly uh scream out look at what god has done or we should be doing in our hearts you know they, they become mundane to us if we're not careful they become something that we're well that's that's nature you know <laughs> it's god's creation if that's what you mean by nature and, and, and if that's what you mean, then, then give it its due. It's God's nature. It's God's creation. It is doing this. Uh, Julie and I will oftentimes joke whenever we see a, a beautiful, like the other day, we were just looking at the beautiful blue sky with the white clouds and the sun was shining. It was, and, and then you look down the green grass and all the color of that you could see just of a, of a regular day. And, and our joke is always this. And just imagine it all happened because of an accidental explosion billions of years ago. All right. That's what, that's what the science, that's what, not the science, not true scientists. That's what the atheist wants us to believe. He wants us to recognize that the beauty we see in this world is merely because we have evolved to the point that we consider these colors to be beautiful. And that's the only reason it's beautiful in the first place. All right, because of our evolution that we have gotten to the point so that we could, the survival of the fittest, so that we could see, we see colors merely so we could tell what's dangerous and what is not dangerous, so that we can tell uh, distances. The colors help us to see diff distances. That they give us all these, all these reasons for these wonders that are in the world. They just happen to happen because we were blessed, or not blessed, they wouldn't say blessed, Lucky enough 
to have ancestors who propagated so that we can have that ability because they happen to overcome the dangers of the world. That's science, supposedly. Well, that's not science. That's not, that's not science at all. Quite, fr quite frank, frankly, that's science fantasy. That's, that's something that is impossible. Let's look and see how God should be praised about a thunderstorm. Okay, David starts out, and this is a Psalm of David. David starts out with these words, ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. He's talked about the idea that you're not giving God strength. Morning, Janet. You're not giving God strength. You're recognizing his strength. You're ascribing what you see to him. You're labeling it. This is of God. This is, this is my, this is glory. This is glorified. This glorifies God because of what it, it is and the fact that he created it. Look at the next one. Ascribe to the Lord glory due to his name. He is God. He is the creator. It's, it's do him. That's the sad, the sad, sick thing about people wanting to say it happened because of an accidental explosion billions of years ago. You're, you're not giving the glory to someone it belongs to. Can you imagine if after a, a, the masterpiece, the Mona Lisa, for instance, or the, or the, the statue of David, uh, what was that, uh, Da Vinci made, was, am I right there? But the stat, oh no, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, the statue of David, and then someone after he had done this masterpiece, had just stood there and said, "Huh, that kind of just formed by itself, didn't it? You know, what are you talking about? I did all this work. I went through here. I saw the stat. According to what according to what Michelangelo said, what you do is you take a piece of granite and you knock off all the things that aren't the statue." All right, that's how you make a statue of David. Well, I'm sorry, if I try to knock things off of there, you know, first thing that would go is where David's head is supposed to be, probably. All right, but that, that wouldn't happen with me. There's a lot more to it than that. But for someone to come up, morning, Rick, but for someone to come up and give, ascribe it to pure chance is sick. It's, it's insulting to, the, to, the master, to, the, to a masterpiece like that. Well, now, blow it up to the entire universe. And people try to ascribe it to nothing but pure luck, nothing but chance that it happened. Maybe the explosion wouldn't have occurred, and therefore none of this would have, would have happened. You know, we'll see, that's, that's truly sick. Um, and then he says, worship the Lord in holy array. Now, if that's talking about the holy array, if it's talking about what we are to wear, or perhaps what the priest is to wear uh, in, in the worship of God as far as the temple worship is concerned, I mean, God, that's God's due. God wants him to be worshipped in that way. Well, in the New Testament, we recognize that there is no particular clothing that we're supposed to wear when we worship God, except for the clothing we should always be wearing, which is modesty, Clothings that are modest, clothings that are appropriate, just for just for our own uh, everyday activities. Um, that type of clothing. Christ. What's that? You're clothed with Christ. Okay, there's my next my next thing. Actually, I wasn't going to say that, and I should have. We're clothed with Christ as Christians, that holy array, and the Christian armor is what I was going to be working up to. Julie came up with one much better than me, but the Christian armor of of uh, Galatians chapter, no, Ephesians chapter 6, the, uh, the Christian armor of the book of Ephesians, you know, we're supposed to have the breastplate of righteousness, the, sh the helmet of salvation, the uh, shield of faith, the, the sword of the word of God, there's how we should be dressed at all times, because God is who he is, now I'll go back and see what he's saying there in verse, th in verse 2, because God is who he is, we should be what God wants us to be. Worship the Lord in a holy array. All right. God, God being who he, he is should affect who we are or who we change ourselves to be. Maybe is a better way of saying it because he's saying here, get your holy array on. Wear, wear what you're supposed to be wearing. 
Okay? For, for the priest, that would be the clothing God ascribed. For the priest of the new covenant, which is Christians, Christians are the priests of the new covenant. That's not some kind of robe. That's not some kind of uh, vestal. What it is, is our spiritual uh, our spiritual clothing uh, from the Lord. Like Julie said, clothed with Christ. Go ahead, Bob. King, King James words that worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the beauty of holiness. So the, so the holiness is the array. Very good. I like that. I like that. But in we should be holy, like like Peter said, First Peter, we should be holy because God is holy. Now, that's not talking about halos over your head, holy. That's talking about set apart from the world, holy. Set apart from, set apart from something that doesn't belong, holy. Okay, verse, verse three, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Now, this, from what I understand, this was a common idea, a common concept of David's day. When you heard the thunder out on the Mediterranean Sea, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. They, you know, when I was a child, we used to say whenever it thundered, the angels were bowling, okay, and knocking down pins. That's the thunder. That's the old, that's the old uh, uh, wives' tale, all right? Well, God is the creator of thunder, and, and it's as if his voice is shouting upon the, upon the waters. It's, it's uh, you know, the, the psalmist is not trying to say that's God's voice. He's, uh, he's applying it or ascribing it to God. God is the one who did that. And so you're hearing his voice. You're hearing his power on the waters. The God of glory thunders. The, um, the Lord is over many waters. Actually, he's over all of them. So, and, that's, and that's many. That's a lot. But the Lord is the creator, the owner, the, the one who is, has the power over it all. Okay. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Okay. We, we have a song in our song books, uh, uh, How Great Thou Art. And one of, the, one of the phrases in there is, when I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout, the universe displayed. Okay, well, all of that pointing towards God, his power. Okay, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Now, you're talking about the wind that comes with a storm, all right, to the point that it can actually break trees. The, the cedars of Lebanon were, were, were incredible trees of the day. But the fact that a huge storm could come along and knock them down, all right. He goes on to say in verse 6, there's a couple of different ideas of what he might be talking about here. I tend to think it's more along the lines of what we've been seeing. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Siron like a wild, like a young wild ox. So, um, there, there's some who believe that he might be talking about future judgment that's going to be coming on those nations, those places. I don't think so. Uh, it, it just falls right out of the context. Okay, it's true that God brings future judgment on those places. Fine. Okay. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's merely talking about what it's like when you have a storm come through and it's like the, the whole area is shaking after a big boom. The wind that's blowing and knocking things over. All right. So it's like the land is just moving because of what's going on with the storm. Either way, it's true. Again, I just don't, I just don't see it context-wise. Why does he suddenly talk about future judgment, and then he comes back and talks again about the natural storm? And so, and so, I tend to believe verse six is merely just that. It's a continuation of showing the power of God and what God is capable of doing. God can make the storm big enough that he wanted to, if he wanted to knock a nation off the map, he could do it. And quite frankly, there's times when we've had hurricanes where it seemed to be almost exactly that, isn't it? Okay, cities destroyed. What's that? This whole psalm, this yeah. whole psalm dwells around the omnipotence of God. Amen. His, his total ability. Amen. Amen. Okay, was there someone else? I thought I heard another voice. Okay. Um, the voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. There's the lightning. Okay. 
uh, incredible, incredible things. You know, I, you think about someone getting shocked, you know, if, if they open up a circuit breaker wrong, <laughs> you know, well, uh, you're going to get 220 volts uh, if you're going to get the big pack and, and a lot of amps. But how many volts and amps are there in a lightning storm? Well, if I remember uh, Back to the Future 1 correctly, what was some kind of gigabytes or something like that, wasn't it? Uh, if, uh, what was it that uh, Professor Brown told uh, Marty? Um, I don't exactly remember what it was. But anyway, it's a lot of electricity. It's a lot of millions voltage. Of volts. What's that? Millions, millions yeah, of volts. Millions of volts. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Again, with the thunderclaps, it shakes. The voice of the Lord, um, no, I'm sorry, the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. By the way, I meant to mention this earlier in this in this in this song. I love that phrase, the voice of the Lord. Remember how God created the universe in Genesis 1? Spoke it into existence. Spoke it into existence. Let there be light. Boom. And there was light. And it was good. Let the let, let the waters separate. Let land appear. Let, the, let there be a, a two lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night, the sun and the moon. Just spoke it into existence. Let us make man in our own image. Just spoke it into existence. So I love, I love that idea. Would you say five minutes? Really, get out of here. No, I've got a oh. point. <laughs> you scared me when you went like that. Okay, good. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Uh, the, the Sirion, S-I-R-I-O-N, yes. is a reference to Mount Hermon, which is the biggest mountain in Israel. So he's there saying that the biggest, he calls it the biggest mountain yeah. to move. Yeah, that's noted back in Deuteronomy 3, 9. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, it's just the God's power over something that's substantial as a mountain. All right. He, you know, Jesus said if we had enough faith, he told his disciples, if they had enough faith, they could cause the mountain to go into the sea. Well, who's, if they were to do such a thing, whose power would they be using? You know, God. God's power. If they were to do such a thing, God has the power to be able to do that. All right. Excellent point, Julie. Thank you. Um, so he, uh, verse nine. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve. Now, when I first read this, my first thought was, and this is true, that God has the power to, to have animals, just like with humans, to be able. It's God's power that allows them to give birth. But I, I liked what this one commentary said that I, that I read on this after I went, well, I believe this is talking about this. The guy, he spoke about, how the, 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 the noise of a thunderstorm can cause an animal, or for that matter, a human being, to give birth prematurely. It's the pressure, the barometric pressure. Yeah, and the bar okay, the barometric pressure, but it can cause, the, can cause premature uh, birth. All right, wasn't going to happen, but now it's happening, type deal. And so, it, you know, the power of a storm like that is able is able to do that. So either way it's talking about. The first is true even without the storm. God is the power of God who causes the deer to calve. Okay? But I wonder if he isn't right given 10 minutes. Okay. I wonder if he if he isn't right given what he says next. And strips the forest bare. So it does sound like it's the storm that's causing the deer to give premature birth. And the strips and the and strips the forest bare, and in his holy temple everything says glory. Now we have a similar thing like that. Hold your hand right here and go with me to Revelation, Revelation chapter uh, what is it? Revelation chapter four, I believe. Revelation chapter Revelation chapter five. Okay. Well, actually, it's both of them. In four and five, we have we have various people uh, in in heaven. We have various uh, the angels. We have the living creatures, and we have nature itself giving God the glory. 
All right. Let's just read a part of that. Look at a look at chapter five, verse eleven to the end of the chapter. That's just five verses, four verses. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that has slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. All right. The idea of God deserving the glory because he's creator, because of his power, because of what he, he has accomplished, because of what he is accomplishing, because of what he will accomplish. God deserves the power, uh, the, the glory. He, he has the power. God deserves the glory. For everything, again, we take it for granted. The sky is a pretty blue today, dear. You know, we take it for granted. It's a wonderful warm day. Oh, what a storm we're having. Oh, wow, you know, glad we have shelter. We take it for granted about how God, the power that God shows in his very nature that he created. Verse 10. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Now, mine, mine has as king in italics. Those words aren't there. But it is implied about God. God's the one who brought the flood on the earth. And God, God showed his power in that regard. When the entire earth was covered with water. When the springs of the deep opened up and shot their waters out. When the windows of the, of the heaven opened up and allowed what I believe to be a, a covering, a vapor covering around the atmosphere of this earth to fall upon the earth. As we, if we understand the way it's described in Genesis chapter 1, the way it was, the fact there had been no rain on earth yet. Well, God is the one who caused all that to happen. Yes, the Lord sits as king forevermore, not just during the flood, but, it, but now. And I guess that's why the words in italics as king in verse 10 because the end of the verse mentions he does it continually forevermore. So he sat as king then, he sits as king now. Okay. Morning, Rick. Good to have you here. Verse 11, final verse. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. I love that first part of that verse. We just noted, he just noted with 10 straight Versus the power of God. What can God do for his people? He can do whatever is within it. What's that? He'll bless them. Bless them. Protect them. Care for them. Help them. God's power is there for our using. We may not always like how he uses it, what he allows to happen and what he doesn't allow to happen. But we need to recognize just as he is so powerful, he also has the smarts to know what's best. Okay? And he will give strength to his people. He will keep his promises. He will keep us, he will keep us safe within his plan. As, as Paul said, and I know we've mentioned it a couple times during the, these studies that we've been having. In a, when he says, I believe it's in the beginning of one of his letters. can't remember which one it is. But, but the Lord is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. All right. Uh, Paul wrote 12, 13 letters. Just read them all. You'll find it somewhere in the first chapter. I can't remember which one it is. But, but he says, he says he, I am convinced he's able to keep that which I've committed against him that day. Against that day. What, what Paul had, had uh, committed to him was his soul, his salvation, his, his life as God's person and God being his God. Okay, we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. And the final thing in that verse, the Lord will bless his people with peace. What was Jesus called? 
Prince of Peace. And yet Jesus said in Matthew 10, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now the problem is, is people are at war with God. Jesus came to teach the truth. Those people who did not want to accept the truth, they have the sword. And they have the sword used against them spiritually. God's at war with them. But for those of us who join God's side, we're no longer at war with him. We have peace with God. And that's a peace that passes all understanding. The idea that even when the worst things are happening to us in our lives, that's nothing compared to the peace we have with God. Okay. Any other comments on Psalm 29? Albert? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Sorry. It's amazing as I'm listening to this psalm. Mm -hmm. Today is the one year anniversary of a tornado that ran through Montgomery County and tore it apart. I remember that. And you can still see aluminum in trees, houses tore up. And it's just amazing to see that power. Yeah. The power of God. The old, the old saying about uh, a piece of straw being run into a telephone pole. You try to do that. Take a piece of straw and just as fast as you can, right into the telephone pole. <laughs> That's going to happen. It's going to break up. The, and you're going to bang your fingers against a telephone pole. You, know, you don't have the power. But the pressure, everything involved. I love the way you said that, Pat. There are still things up in the trees from a storm a year ago. Because either man doesn't want to take the time or he or it's too difficult or to put the effort into taking it down and God God's nature put it up there. You know. Mother mm -hmm. my mother used to have a picture and I don't know whatever happened to it, I wish I had it, of a uh, of a two before or a piece of large wood that was driven through a tree. Yeah. Uh, again, try to do that. Build the machine that will do that, you know, and, and imagine how much work it would have it would take to come up with something that would not only have the force to do it, but have the delicacy to not break that two by four in half while doing it. Yes. You know, what's that? One minute. Well, we did good. I'm basically done. <laughs> good comments, everyone. Appreciate it. Really do appreciate. It. Any other comments? That verse 11 mm -hmm. is one of the promises of God that we need to keep in mind. That he will, can and will strengthen us. That's right. When we need it. That's right. And use his strength for us. Yes. You know, we'll give his strength. You're right. He gives us his strength and he uses it for us. Morning, Steve. Let's go ahead and have our prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our God. Father, please help us to never take things for granted. The, the power that you show and the love that you show, Father, by using that power for our sake. The way you've cared for us, Father, when you could just as easily had chucked us all away because of our own sin. Father, we ask you to please help us to always recognize that, to give you the glory that you deserve. And then some, Father. Well, there's no then some. You deserve all the glory. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Well, it looks like we lost Zoom. <laughs> Good deal. Well, we, we did real well. Um, we'll see you all. We'll see you all on Facebook. We'll see you all tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock, 930.